All right, so hey guys, this is La Queen. Thank you, Teresa. Hey, Sam, how you doing? Sometimes the only person you got to support is yourself. And so that's pretty much how it works all the time. I'm not in Washington, D.C. I'm not in Albany, New York. I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm doing a webinar live tonight. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I had two invitees. They didn't come. Oh, well, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about coronavirus. Coronavirus. So follow me. I sent you guys a link on Zoom. It's, I'm on Zoom right now and I'm on Twitter. And I'm going to also try to feed this back to, to YouTube. Don't know how that's going to work, but I'm trying to do the very best I can and get out there and try to do the very best I can. Here is my background. Just pretty much everything else. Just kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it. Try to do the very best I can. Get this situated and pretty much talk about COVID-19. I wasn't at the governor in Albany, Governor Cuomo. But you know what? I'm here. I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts, in a safe place. Um, I don't have a lot of hair, but you know what? God is good. Breast cancer survivor. Um, I'm going to introduce myself, make this really qu quick and simple. It is 7.30 here on a Sunday night. My name is LaQueen Battle, LaQueen Terry Battle. I am a certified medical assistant, first aid responder. I have three degrees. My first degree is in, um, I have a medical assistant degree from Houston, Texas. I have an associate of arts degree in, from Chicago, from Harris. Washington College, and I have a third degree um, from from uh, Purdue University in Hammond, Indiana. So very happy to be here. I'm currently studying, doing research on the coronavirus, and I'm on Zoom and I'm on Twitter. I'm working on my at hopefully trying to get my master's in nursing. So I'm studying on the side as well as applying to nursing schools, getting out here and making my voice known, trying to get the best backdrop possible, making my voice known, making my uh, everything known. So I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm happy to be here. And let's talk about COVID-19 coronavirus, okay? Woo! <laughs> so I did have a PowerPoint presentation about it, but... um. I try to share it on my Zoom. Oh, well. Hey, you want to go? Hey, hey, Anna, hi. Okay, bring Anna. Okay. Oh, well, I'm going to add you on Anna. Okay, you don't have to add on. It's a, just follow me on Zoom. So pretty much I did have the presentation on Zoom. Um, I'm still working through, going through a lot of technical difficulties right now. I'm trying to screen share on Zoom. Um, and right now I'm just going through a lot of technical technical difficulties um but bear with me guys twitter has been following me for the last 20 minutes i got about 20 30 30 more minutes left on um on this um this on the zoom feed so hopefully this is only my first part this is only my first one so bear with me guys i'm still doing this on my own but eventually sometimes the best things you can do are on your own as well as try to get published now a spoken word i'm visual now i need to get out there and get my get get published I'm writing, I'm writing about it. I need to write about it. I need to write about my experiences and try to get published, try to get published in paper and feed. So um, I am currently, I've been, in, I've been in government for all my life since I was in high school. I've also been in the military uh, prior um, United States Army Reserves in Seagullville, Texas, outside headquarters, Little Rock, Arkansas. I have little brother, Lakeen Jamal Harris, is currently United States Marine Corps, hoorah. And I am... Um, very happy to have family all over the military. My uncle, my aunt in the Navy and the Army. Their sons are the Marines. I have two cousins in the Marines. Um, very, very happy. Two cousins in the Marines. Another little brother in the Marines. Um, my high school sweetheart, Craig Eddie White, is currently retired from the United States Air Force. And um, I'm just very happy to be here tonight. So whoever's watching me, either on Zoom, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, very happy to have you guys here tonight. So there's a lot of transferring on information going on. I got about 20 more minutes left on Zoom. I will download the PowerPoint presentation to YouTube as well as to Facebook to let you guys know what I'm studying. I'm always doing updates, always renewing, always doing what I can to try to get the word about. I've been pretty much looking for work over 30 different cities looking for work. And so it's been a struggle right now as a person with three college degrees Currently trying to get my life together, currently trying to do what I can and also be focused and be be situated by like, what I want to do. There's a virus, there's an epidemic going on. There's a lot of situations going on. What do I do? How do I take care of myself and how do I best prepare myself for other people? So I have this great, great PowerPoint presentation, a great PowerPoint presentation. And unfortunately, nobody's here tonight to watch me and assist me with this. So I'm pretty much going to have to do everything on my own. So shout out to you guys in my Twitter feed. Hi, how you doing? 
so pretty much the title of my presentation is on is uh, follow follow me with you, follow with me guys it's called assessing triage for covid patients the presentation is on um is on my zoom and i'm going to try to screenshot share it i'm having some low tech difficulties but pretty much what I want to talk about tonight is assessing triage for COVID patients. Now, it's very important right now, as of currently May 2020, May 17, 2020, on Sunday night at 7.30, right now, the United States is still in an epidemic with coronavirus, with COVID virus. Right now, the United States has not declared war against anybody, but we still are in a virus situation, uh, an epidemic. Of, our government is still pretty much shut down. Store, clothing stores, J.C. Penney's, uh, Lord and Taylor, um, Nordstrom's, uh, God, J. Crew are actually declaring bankruptcy. There's a lot of stores that are declaring bankruptcy, and we as a country need to, to need to come together to figure out what is more important: is the economy more important, or is focusing on the medical situation more important? And I've been here to 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 doctors and nurses here all over Boston area. And when I ask them what is more important, what is more important to assess, to assess, to assess, they tell me that the main situation, the main issue to assess is COVID-19. COVID-19 is the main issue. COVID-19 is the main situation. That's what we need to be focused on is COVID-19, not the economy, not anything else. It's actually COVID-19. That is our main situation. That is what we need to be focused on. So right now, COVID-19 is an epidemic. It's closed down a lot of situations. People are in, are, are in unemployment. And right now, that is a big situation. There's a low, the unemployment rate has been the highest it's ever been in years. Um, people, businesses are closing down that have been around for 80, 100 years since the Great Depression. And right now, people are not able to actually recognize what is going on. Is this a political innuendo figure where you're telling everybody to stay at home measures? You don't want to go anybody, don't want people to go outside. You want people to stay inside, keep them afraid, keep them worried cause anxiety, cause depression, cause mental illness situation? Or do you want people to rise up and stand out and do and to fight against this virus and to demonstrate and to protest about what is going on? But as a medical professional like myself, I still, still need a job. I still need stability in my career. And I still need to do always do current and updated research about what is going on in the medical field, what is going on, what kind of infectious diseases are going on, not just here, here in the United States, but all around the world. So that is an issue that I need to be focused on as well as a lot of other people need to be focused on, on what is going on currently in the United States. And it seems like, oh, oh, that, that disease, oh, that virus will never happen in the United States. Oh, it just happens in Africa. Oh, it just happens in the Middle East. Oh, it just happens to, to countries all around the world. Oh, it's just a virus. Oh, it won't it won't affect us. Oh, it won't affect the United States. Well, yes, yes, it will. This virus will impact the United States. It will impact other people. That's why, not just as a medical professional like myself, who's been in the medical field for over five, 10 years, part-time, full-time, volunteering, whatever you want to call it, it is still important for professionals as well as laymen to figure out how do we get through times like these? How do we overcome struggles like these? How do we get through Great Depressions, through Spanish flus, through world wars, through, you know, um, atomic bombs? How do we properly assess this situation, this virus in a new millennium, in a new situation, in a new century, 2020, a virus and a virus could actually infect and close down governments in a new century. This is technology. Technology controls the world. So if technology controls the world, then how in the world can a simple flu-like bug virus take over the whole entire world and close down governments, close down countries? That's why it's important to, to assess that that medicine, that viruses, that human diseases are still in control of governments. That if a human disease, a human virus can can impact and can make a move in governments, then yes, it can impact the world. And technology doesn't control the world. Human viruses and human diseases control the world. And that's why as that's why I, it's very hard for people to understand what the title of my presentation is about. It's about how do you properly assess this situation? How do you assess it? Do I worry about the medical? Do I stop going to the hospital? Do I stop going to the emergency room? How do I properly, properly assess the situation? Assess and how do I 
I triage as a medical professional? How do I triage somebody coming to the emergency room either with COVID-19 or with a regular heart disease? Because as of right now, the top, top three, um, top three ways to die right here, the statistics of death, of death by the top, the top causes of death by the CDC in the United States, the number one cause of death is not coronavirus by the CDC. The number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease. It's not coronavirus. It's not the flu. The number one cause of death in the United States right now is heart disease. So if the number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease, why are we focusing so much on an infectious disease, a, a coronavirus, a COVID-19 virus, then we, we, that we should be focusing on heart attacks, heart disease, ba gastric bypass surgeries, hypertension, hypotension. That's what the government should be focusing on. It shouldn't be focusing on, it should be less attention on an infectious disease and more research into the leading causes of death that has still not changed. Imagine an impact that coronavirus has killed over 200,000, 300,000 people all around the world and the number one cause of death still as today, as of May the 17th, 2020, the leading cause of death all, all, by the, all over America is not coronavirus, is not the flu. The leading cause of death is heart disease. Why is that not influenced by the media? Why is that not an issue addressed by the media? Why are so many celebrities, singers, folk people, dying people, publishers dying? And they're not dying in the hospital. These celebrities all over the news, actors, singers, publishers, comedians, Little Richard, Fred Willard, they're all dying at home because they're afraid to go to the hospital and catch an, catch an infectious disease and get even more sick. Right now, hospital beds are empty. They're not full. And you're giving the U.S. United States government is giving these private institutions at three trillion dollars to continue their research to continue their research to continue their research you're giving united states hospitals three trillion dollars to continue their research that is an issue and hospital bids are empty and the leading cause of death by America, by the CDC, is not coronavirus. It's not the flu. It is heart disease. So if the leading cause of heart disease is heart disease, then that should be the focus of the United States government. That should be the focus. The focus should be on research for heart disease, research for hypertension, research for diabetes, research for lung cancer. But it's not. It's not. It's on a flu bug. Imagine how much of an impact this virus, this flu has had over the whole entire world and we're still willing to invest our whole entire future of the, of the United States economy into hospitals and institutions that now, as of right now, as of May 2020, now these hospitals are running empty institutions, empty institutions. These hospitals are now Raising up, in, you're hiring a buttload of nurses and doctors and clinical staff only to go to work and work in facilities where you have one coronavirus patient come in and the whole facility has 20 bids for one coronavirus. So you have 20 empty bids and one, 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 one patient. That is a waste of facilities and that's a waste of resources. And that's what I talked about yesterday. A waste of resources, a waste of resources for three trillion dollars to have to come to the hospital, a hospital and an empty emergency room, an empty emergency room at a hospital. And day by day by day in the newspaper, I'm seeing celebrities and singers and media people and publishers die in their 60s, in their 50s, in their 70s. They die and you don't see them publish the cause of death. Oh, they died in the hospital surrounded by family. No, they're dying at their at their homes. They're dying in their homes. They're afraid. And, and I was reading a lot, a lot, and watching on all these news articles. And I have, I have my presentation ready, guys. I'm going to have to share it with you guys. Um, download it and share it with you guys. 
because I know they just had another White House briefing. I'm on my Zoom meeting right now. I'm going to have to schedule this and get this set up again. From Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. I've been on Facebook all day. I'm on Twitter right now, and I'll probably be on LinkedIn and YouTube as well. It's very, it's very important because I, I thank you, doctors. I thank you, nurses. I thank you, police and fire department and all these research scientists for giving all your energy and all your time and, and all your exposure, all your research credentials to helping out an epidemic that has happened all around the world. Thank you for being the solution to the problem. Thank you be, to being to the solution to the problem. But you know what? It's not over yet. There should be a continual, continual flow of patients coming through the doors of the hospital. It should be a continuing and a continuing and a continuing flow, a flow, a flow, a flow. But it's not a continuing flow. It's not. And right now, the rate of hospital admission has dropped and the rate of people dying by coronavirus has risen. Why is that? Why is the rate of hospital admission? Hospitals were curated to help people through pandemics. Hospitals were curated to help people through, through viruses, through Spanish flus, nurses, nursing staff. They were, they were born for this. Their job is to assess people through all types of situations, heart disease, cancer, labor and delivery, as well as infectious diseases. So if you, if you have a ward available for people to add an isolation ward available to help COVID patients, put those COVID, create isolation wards, not just mental wards, but create isolation wards to help people with this virus, like they did in the Spanish flu of 1918. But... What happened was, in 1918, you had soldiers coming from overseas. They were coming back home and they were traveling over different cities across America. And everywhere the soldiers went, the Navy, so the Navy men, the Army soldiers, everywhere the Navy went, everywhere the Army went, they took along with them the virus. And, and overseas, these Army and these Navy men and women... We're, we're working and digging in trenches full of sewage, full of human feces and waste, full of pig waste. As well as the inner cities in the early 1920s and 30s where New York was unregulated, where New York was shack houses, shickety shackety houses. People were living in wooden shack houses in New York City in the 1930s and the 1920s. And they had the outhouses in the center of the alley. And the outhouses and the whole alleys was filled with human waste and feces. And a virus comes along and desecrates the whole entire New York City. Because the city and the housing and the housing departments were unregulated. And you have the Spanish flu coming to Philadelphia. The Spanish flu came into New York City. The Spanish flu came all across the United States and decimated populations and populations of people. Because the people were, were unregulated and they, and they were not ready. They celebrated too early. They thought, oh, the war, oh, the world, the war is over. Oh, we're happy. No, the war is not over. The flu is still here. We have to do something about this. We have to contain the situation. And you know what? The, co the COVID virus right now has still not been contained. People don't celebrate yet. Oh, the government's open. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The government's open. But right now, the rate of transmission has gone down a little bit. But, if you, but the hospital doors need to be full. If the rates are going down, that means the hospital doors need to be full. Full. People need to be coming through the doors of the hospital for other reasons. If heart disease is still the leading, leading factor of death in the United States, that should also be another reason for people to come through the hospital doors. But it's not. People are scared to come to the hospital because of COVID-19. So as a medical professional, I'm working in hospitals and I'm working in clinics. And as of May, May 17th right now, Nobody's coming into my clinic because people are afraid to come into a hospital, a, sanit a, sanitary, a sanitary facility, 
They're afraid to catch something, to catch it, catch their death in a, sanit a sanitized facility rather than stay at home and die at home from a pre-existing a pre condition. They rather stay and die at home from a pre-existing easy condition that can be assessed by a doctor in five minutes and giving medicines for that, for that illness, for that disease, for hypertension, for diabetes, it can be easily going to a hospital, an emergency room for five, 10 minutes, see a doctor, see a triage doctor and go back home in less than 15, 20 minutes. And that could be the number one most preventable way that person could have not died. But right now, as of a Sunday, May the 17th, people are dying and dying and dying by the buttload because they refuse to go to the emergency room hospitals and get preventive care. People refuse to get preventive care. And now the United States government is propaganda has propaganda talking about telehealth is the new type of medicine. Telehealth is the new way. Telehealth is the way to go. No, you cannot tele telesize. You cannot put medicine on the phone. You A doctor is not supposed to make phone calls. A doctor is supposed to come to people in person and assess that patient in person to figure out what is the patient telling you versus what their signs and symptoms t say. Because a person can say one thing, but their body is completely telling them something different. So a person on the phone may say, oh, I'm feeling well today. I don't have a fever. But if you see them in person, that person's face and their skin is pale and blue. And, and their breathing is heavy labored. And they lost about 30 pounds since the last time you saw them. But they don't want to talk, talk about it over the phone. So yes, yes, telehealth is the next best new wave of medicine. Telehealth, telehealth. And yes, the insurance companies are getting buttloads of money from telehealth. Insurance companies are getting buttloads and buttloads of money from telehealth. But that is not the way medicine was created to be. Medicine was created to be, you come to your doctor in person, doctors make house calls, they do not make phone calls. They come to you, they observe your family life, they observe your home life, and they are able to help you better in person than they are able to help you even at their own clinic, even at their own doctor's office, even at their own facility. Doctors, sometimes the best way that doctors are able to help patients is to come into their home, see what is going on in their home, assess their home life and their family life, and then be able to make a decision on their health, just basically figuring out what is going on in their home. That is the way medicine was created to be. And that's the way it's been for centuries. That's how it started. Doctors make house calls. My Zoom stop. No, oh, my Zoom's still going. I had a presentation, but oh well, I'm just gonna have to download it and 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 work on it and zoom it again. <laughs> That's the way that doctors were created to be. And this is an argument that I'm aware. And I had a presentation about it on my PowerPoint. How do we properly assess and triage these COVID patients, this epidemic, from the rest of the United States population? There are other diseases and there are other illnesses out there that are way more important and that will subs have subsized this, have over, 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 over this way more important things. But yes, this will pass. But obviously right now, this COVID-19 is not going anywhere. As of right now, governments are reopening, but they're opening at a slow pace for a reason. So as a medical professional, as a medical assistant, as a CNA, as a nurse aide, as a nurse, as an LPN, as a physician assistant, as an LPN, I come have a patient come into my care. My main goals is to assess them. Assess what's going on in their body. What is it telling me? What 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 are they? What is their body? What is their measurements trying to tell me? What is their blood pressure telling me? What is their pulse telling me? What is their breathing telling me? How's their home life? Are they going through depression? Are they going through anxiety? What are they going through? 
what is going on to that person. And I've been reading through it. I've been reading through it. I've been reading through it. I'm trying to watch my eyes. It, it really hurts. It really hurts to see government pop, government so much worried about an illness rather than patient care and patient safety. And if the main focus of a government was to tell people to stay at home, then there should be a core, a core of volunteers created by the government to go to knock on people's doors and to figure out really what is really going on in people's homes. There should be a nurse. There should be a core of students or a government core of nurses, a nurse core created just to knock on people's doors and just to go door to door to door, house to house to house, knock on people's, knock on people's doors and ask them a simple question. Do you have a fever? Are you breathing okay? That's all we need to know. We're going to go to your next door neighbor. How old are you? Do you have anybody elderly in your home? Just like the census. It should be a government, government department created, created again to create a, it's called a core of students or it's called a nurse, a nurse core like, Fred, like FDR did during the 1920s. He created a core, he created different departments within the government to help people figure out what was going on during the Great Depression. But we don't have a government like that. We don't have a current administration like that in office. We don't. You do as I say and not as I do. That's what kind of government we have right now. You do as I say and not as I do. If you have a government propagandizing people to, to tell them to stay at home, wear face masks, and you should have uh, nurses and doctors and, and people and technicians training people to go door to door and house to house asking people what is going on in your house and why is this virus spreading across the world. So we're not going to try to keep it contained in, in our house because obviously it's not being contained in people's houses. Because when people walk outside, walk from their houses outside, it's spreading. So it must be something in the house. Is it the food? Is it the food supply? Is it the pets? Is it the cleaning solution? What is it and where is this virus coming from? And why has the rates not gone down? And why has over 300,000 people all around the world die in less than six months? Why has over 300,000 people died all around the world of a flu bug in less than a year, a six months to a year? Why, why is this going on? And why are not people knocking door to door and house to house about this? Why are people not, not going door to door and house to house? Oh, I don't want people going to my door. I don't want people knocking on my door. You best believe they better knock on your door. You best believe they better knock on your door and figure out what is going on and why our government shutting down and why our companies are closing, closing down businesses for good. Why is there a food shortage? Why are farmers, millions of farmers, throwing away Good process, good, good fruits and vegetables. Why are farmers throwing away their food? Why are the farmers not only throwing away their food, but being told to throw away their food supply? Because we can't sell this product. It's not getting, it's not making us any money. So rather than give away the food product, give away the food, farmers are throwing it away and damaging fresh fruits and vegetables. And people have to go out to and rescue fresh fruits and vegetables for being pilgrimage by farmers who cannot sell, make a profit out of, out of their livelihood. Mm -hmm. 
Farmers are throwing away fresh produce all around the United States because they cannot make a sale. Because the United States economy right now has lowered the price of fresh produce so low it's ridiculous. And now millions of farmers all around the world, it's been like this for years and years since Trump and Obama were in office. Millions of farmers all across the United States, from Iowa to Idaho, all across the United States, are, are having to mortgage and foreclose on their homes and their farms. Because they cannot sell their, their product. Farmers, American farmers, American farmers. This is not this is not just going on the top of my head. I'm reading this right. I've been reading this in the news for years and years and years. I've been reading this in the news and on PBS and on CBC and on NBC, Nightly News, all of that. WRR, all of that. PBS Radio, all of that, all around. The, you all for years and years and years, farmers are losing their land, losing their farms, losing their mortgages because they cannot sell good American produce. And what do I do as a medical professional, as a medical clerk? I see somebody coming to the emergency room that is malnourished, that has pneumonia, that has high fever, and they're diabetic. And I have to figure out, does this person have COVID-19 virus or do they have other causes, other underlying issues that should be more focused on rather than a basic Pneumonia, flu, but yes, yes, COVID virus is important, but there are other issues out there. And yes, the Spanish flu killed over over ten over populations, millions and millions, eight hundred thousand people died by the Spanish flu around the world. Eight hundred thousand people died of the Spanish flu. Do you think the U.S. government had time to worry about other diseases and other illnesses? No, because it was going through a war. It was going through World War I when the Spanish flu happened in 1918. The United States government, the whole entire world, the global system, the global economy was going through a world war in 1918, 1920. 1916 to 1918, World War I. I might be wrong on those on those dates. I might be I might be really wrong. The United States was going through a war in 1918-1920. Do you think nurses had time to worry about oh there are other leading causes of death? No, we got to focus on this flu. We got to get these patients in and out. And why are we being sick? Yeah, of course. Yes, of course, other nurses and other doctors got to focus on coronavirus, COVID virus. Yes, but if people are not coming through hospital doors, if hospital beds are empty, that is another another situation that should be focused on. If you have celebrities every single day, over 10 celebrities a day are dying of this virus. COVID virus, that is a, that is something that should be taken, not taken lightly. If you see over 10 uh, highly paid people a day on TV reporting their deaths, highly millionaires dying of this virus, and they're not going to emergency rooms to get preventive care. That is an issue that should be not, not taken lightly. At least every single day since the past week, I've seen over five celebrities, five media personnel die. Fred Riddler, Little Richard, uh, another singer, another publisher in their 40s, 50s, and 60s dying. And what is the cause of death? The media won't say. The media won't say what the cause of death is. They won't say what the cause of death is. But does it say that they died in the hospital? No, it doesn't say that they died in the hospital. They just report that they died and that's it. Oh, she died of a long battle with cancer. Oh, she died of a long battle with kidney disease. Yeah, right, because the COVID virus only escalated the situation.
There should be preventive care in place to take care of these issues. If you're going to give the United States government, if the United States government is going to give hospitals and institutions three trillion dollars, you best better believe that there should not be another celebrity on TV dying of an unknown cause of death. An unknown cause of death. Another celebrity, another TV person dying. Another singer. Another comedian. Another comedian. Dying of an unknown, an unknown cause of death because they refuse to go to the hospital in the emergency room and get care. I was even looking up some more statistics today. It said 11% of deaths were due to patient deterioration, not being recognized or acted on appropriately. Talking about patient safety. Just think, if you could get somebody into the emergency room, into the hospital doors, before the situation escalated and got, and got worse, you could save that person's life. Yeah, that is true. That is true. And as a medical assistant, my job is to help assess people and to figure out what is going on and how do I not escalate the situation any 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 worse. And at the same time, patient that I should think about that patient safety at the same time too. What happened before they got into the hospital and how can I stop it from getting any worse than it is right now, which is what I just said. Because right now, human error, human problems Error problems even even is can be the cause of death in hospitals too. Any kind of type of error in a hospital can cause somebody to die easily. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm going through this coronavirus situation right now. I'm thinking to myself, what does the United States government tell me to do? And what does my medical profession and that patient's history say for myself? What does that say for myself? What does the United States government tell me to do? What is going on in the media and the news and the CDC and the NIH and the WHO? What do they tell me to do versus when I look at that patient's personal health history and I see their signs and I see their symptoms? What does that tell me? When I see just over six months ago, the hospitals, the lines drawn up and down, people dying in wards and hallways in the hospitals. And now, four weeks later, the hospital, the hospital wings and beds are completely empty. How does that work? How does six weeks ago, hospitals were filled up with COVID patients? And now, and now, two weeks later, Three weeks later, hospital ER emergency rooms are completely blank and empty. How does that work out? How do you make people go back to normal and actually get, get help? You need help. You need help. Please come back. Please do not be afraid of getting help and get it preventive care. Do not let telehealth and telemed telemedicine be an excuse for you not to get emergency care. Because in the midnight hour, you cannot call on your doctor to come and, and make a, a quick phone call for you. Some people can call their doctors in the midnight hour. But if you're going through an emergency situation and you are hard, having a heart attack, you need to pick yourself up, call somebody and have them take you to the emergency room instead of staying at home and waiting on a phone call. You need to pick your things up and get to the emergency room. People are now dying at home, are they being found dead, and the and the press has to report them dead. Cause of death unknown. Oh, that patient had a long history of, yeah, right. 
That patient was found dead in their home. That person, that celebrity was found dead in their home. Because they didn't want to go to the hospital because of coronavirus. So how do I identify, separate, and make sure that this person has COVID virus and make sure that they get the help stay in the hospital and when they leave and when they recover, make sure that they get all the particular type of help they need. And make sure that that person is able and willing to come back through those same hospital doors and be seen physically and be triaged physically to make sure that they don't show visually or physically any, any similar signs and symptoms that were there before. How do I make sure that that does not happen again? You came to the hospital with a sickness, a physical sickness, and you need to return back to the hospital to make sure that you don't have any other signs of that physical Ill illness present. You came to the hospital with an illness, and you need to return back with a synopsis. A, <laughs> a, a prognosis that your health is better. <laughs> Synopsis, that's the word. <laughs> It is true because you, when it comes to the hospital, you have a high fever. Three weeks later, you recover. You need to still come back into that same hospital and still see the same doctor so they can actually physically, visually assess you and make sure that you are the set, still the same person, but you're doing better. You don't need to make a physical phone call. A physical phone call to somebody that just recovered from a viral infection is not going to help that person. You cannot do that. You cannot telehealth a person that just, that just recovered from pneumonia. That is not right. That is not right. That is not ethical to telehealth somebody that has just recovered from pneumonia. You need to make sure that that person comes back into the office and you need to make sure that that person is physically assessed to make sure that their temperature is the same, to make sure that their body weight is the same and there's no visual uh, differences in their body weight. There's no major issue of body loss or body gain. You need to assess their, their vitals. And when you do health, telehealth, you do not assess people's vitals when you do telehealth. That is not an excuse. That is not an excuse to not do people's vitals because of telehealth. That is not an excuse. Please do not let telehealth be an excuse for you not to be seen by a doctor. Because insurance companies are making money, one way or another. And now what the government is, is, is propagating, again, they call it contract tracing, which Bill Bellazio is doing, where that they will observe a person that has been positively tested for the virus, and they will assess a person and they recall every single person that has communication with that person and ask every single contact that has a had communication with that person, have you had sexual relations with that person? And have you been tested for coronavirus? They call it contract tracing. <laughs> they will go to that person that has been tested and they will they find each and every single person. They have to write down every single person that they have had have, have contact with, physical contact, and they have to actually call that person on the call log, call log list and make sure have you been exposed to you've been exposed to coronavirus? Please come in and get tested. It's humiliating. It is humiliating. It is really sad. It is a good thing. Contract tracing is a good thing. And it can be a bad thing too.
And that's, that's how it should be. Because if you're telling people to stay at home, make sure that they stay at home for a reason. And please go knock on people's doors and ask them, have you been exposed to the virus? Please come and get tested. If you're going to test people in, the, in their cars, you best believe you need to test people in their homes too. Because whatever they, they, whatever they do in that car, they're also going to do inside their own home. And there probably are just as many American cars or there's just as many American houses, homes. Now, some, some things I say, some people might disagree with, you know, but I'm just going on based on my own intuition and based on my own, own, own perception. I feel my own perception. Off of my own perception. So when I when I had this presentation, I was thinking to myself, like, what does it mean to frontline triage somebody? Okay, that means I'm the very first person that has that point of contact with that person. I am the frontline person. I am there at that exact, exact moment when the situation happens, when the emergency happens. I am that first person's first point of contact. Somebody comes to me and says, I have pneumonia. I have, have a fever. Can you help me? I'm not breathing correctly. I don't feel good. I am that frontline first person's first point of contract, contact. So how do I triage this person? What do I do? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a nurse aide. I'm just a daycare worker. What do I do? What do I do? Okay, I had a person sit down and I asked them, can I get your temperature? Let me get your temperature right quick. Are you feeling okay? Do you have any fevers? Do you have any chills? Did you have a good night rest last night? Are you breathing okay? How do you feel? What did you eat today? How's, 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 your, how's your family life? I keep asking these questions, asking them questions to figure out what is the what is the reason and if the same thing is going on next door and next door and next door then i have to get get together me and a group of my friends my nurse friends and go door to door and ask everybody what is going on and try my very best to contain the situation i have to figure out how to contain the situation and sometimes what happened in wuhan wuhan was not able to con have contain the situation because the government refused to publish what was going on in China. And when people started tra traveling out of China, then the flu spread. And that's what happened when the Spanish flu in 1918 hit. People were traveling, still traveling by horse or by train or by car. And that's how it's, and, and that's how it spread by military, by boat, and that's how it spread. So what am I to do? What am I to tell the government? I'm here to tell the government that yes, that there needs to be uh, containment issues and it's not over yet, but still at the same time though, we have to figure out how to regulate this. Yay, yay, the government's open back up. That's great. That's awesome. But we still need to learn how to properly triage these patients the correct way so that we can lower the rates of transmission and still increase, increase technology and increase methods of scientific discovery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what happened. When the Spanish flu of 1918 hit, then Ebola came around a, a, a one or two years later. And you know, you best believe the United States government knew what to do when Ebola hit. Hit America. First they had a Spanish flu, now they got Ebola. Well, we're going to make a difference here. We're going to develop a vaccine because we're not, now we know what to do about it. 
But you think a vaccine is the only solution? No, the a vaccine is only maybe 20, 30 percent of the solution. What the solution needs to be done is, yes, you need to create more government institutions to help regulate infectious diseases, as well as increase technology, increase scientific discovery. Those are all good. But at the same time, though, you need to stop the fear in people. Stop the fear in people. Help people and ask them, please still go to the emergency room. Please still get help. Do not hide your symptoms. Do not be afraid of getting help. Please do not be afraid of getting help, even if it's a little bitty thing, even if you're having a little bit of heart palpitations. Even if, even if you have just a, a little bit of chills at night, go get help. Go to the emergency room. I have my presentation, have my notes ready. <laughs> I have my PowerPoint ready, and now I had a little low tech difficulties. But I'm going to do this next Sunday too. I hopefully, you know, and I have a little bit more following. As a, as a nursing professional, you need to encourage, encourage, encourage your patients, encourage your point, your, your people that are in your care to continue to see you, to continue to come into the doctor's office, to continue to, to get treatment, to continue to do the same thing that they're doing over and over again and do not change their, their, their point of care. So when it when it when it, a, a flu or a virus hits and they tell you to stay at home, okay, well stay at home. But at the same time, though, make sure that you have somebody coming, knocking on your doors, and checking up on you physically as well. Make home calls, make home visits. Call a home health aide to make sure that that person is okay. Have that person, have their insurance company, bill them for home health. That should be that. That should be what governments should be doing. They should be creating more home health aides, but they're not. They're instituting telehealth. They should be creating more nurses. There should be government organizations ready to train nurse aides in less than six weeks. There should be a whole, whole recruitment on, on TV saying, we train nurse aides. You can become a nurse aide in less than six weeks. Work for the government. The government is promoting nurse aides. But you don't see that on TV. You don't see it on TV. Become a nurse aide. Become a delivery driver in less than six weeks. Free training, free tuition, but you don't see it. The government, why won't the government promote free education? Free education. Free education. But you want to give the U.S. Econ the U.S. Uh, uh, American people a thousand dollars, another thousand dollars here, another thousand dollars here, but you will not promote and encourage free education. You're going to give somebody a grant in their hand, but you will not encourage them to get to get training, to get a job in order to give you that grant back in their hand and double it. And I'm at fault too. I'm reckless and I don't know how to budget either. But I'm still, if you give somebody a fish, you teach them how to fish, they will learn how to do that for the rest of their life. But right now the government is not promoting that. And it's it's really hard to see that. See people with student loans. Okay, you know what? We'll, we'll take care of all your student loans. That's great. But train us for free. Help us to go out into our economies and to our neighborhoods and ask our neighbors, we've been trained to do this. We know what's going on. Let us help you. Let us lessen the situation.
We know what's going on. Let us help you. And knock on that person's door. Let us help you. Tell us what's going on. Okay, you're okay. What neighbor down the block needs some help? That's how it should work, but it's not. That's what they did during the Spanish flu. They went from knocking from people's door to door and house to house and actually found out what was going on by taking pictures of it. And the government was actually taking pictures, had, had people start taking pictures of it to figure out what was really going on and what the Spanish flu was really about. And why was it killing so many people? When people started taking pictures of it, then they knew what was going on. Pictures of people in filthy slums with, with feces and manure all over the place. Soldiers having to walk, having to walk through trenches of feces six feet high with their horses. And their, horse, their horses were walking through a six, a four or five feet high waste of dirt and feces. And they have to use, uh, use the restroom in the, same, in the same mud. And they have to feed off this filthy mud. And they have to use the same water in that filthy mud. And go back home to America with that same waste in their hands and their bodies. So what the government, what the Trump administration is encouraging, encouraging by the CDC, is called source control. It's called source control. Source control. That means we figure out where the situation is coming from. We figure out the origin of it. We kill that. We, we try to lessen and minimize that origin as much as possible to contain it. And then we that's how we control the situation, stop it from escalating. We figure out where the source came back, came from, and try to contain it and squeeze it out as much as possible, if not kill it. They call it source control, source control, source control. Instead of what patient safety is. When I look at patient safety, I look at somebody's physical health. I assess them as a medical assistant. I'm encouraged to promote patient safety, patient safety. What is their health telling me and what is their body telling me? Can that person speak? Can they can they think clearly? Are they breathing okay? What's more important, source control or patient safety? Source control or patient safety? And yeah, I like books. I like the smell of books, yeah. But what's more important though? You read it, but, but they're not they're not they're not publishing it. They're not publishing it. It's not it's not gonna be it's not gonna be in the newspaper. You're not gonna see that you're not gonna see it in a newspaper. It's called source control. They're not gonna publish source control in the in the media. They're not gonna say the words in the in the New York Times source control. They're not gonna say that in the books or are in the press. Oh yeah, the, the the Trump administration is encouraging source control and social distancing. No. When I look at that person, I look out for their safety and I look out for their well-being. And I try to minimize any type of human error I can as as less as possible. I try to get all of their measurements. I try to get as much accurate measurements as possible. Laqueen Battle. Yes, I Laqueen Battle. I'm a medical assistant. Every person that comes into my point of care, I look out for their safety. I try to get as accurate a blood pressure reading as possible, as accurate as a pulse, as accurate as a temperature pulses, temperature measurement as possible. And then I assess them and give the report back to the doctor who can make the final assessment, the final report. But if I see people in and out every single day, blocking, blocking the emergency room. And then two weeks later, nobody is even walking through the emergency room doors. That is a problem. 
Well, are you telling me that the coronavirus has gone away because nobody's going through the emergency rooms anymore? No. Are you telling me that coronavirus is over, COVID-19 is over because nobody's coming to the hospital anymore? That's great. That's great. The 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 percentage of heart heart disease has decreased. The numbers of heart of the rates of heart disease, of lung cancer has decreased because people stop going to the emergency room. That's awesome. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. Just because you stop reporting how many people died of heart disease does not mean that it does not go that that it went away. That it lessened. I have to make sure that that person is in no way compromised, that they are screened correctly, that they are stabilized, and that they are safe in my, in my care. That they are safe from harm and that they are safe in order to continue the, treat, the medical treatment that they need. That is my job as a, to assess and to triage that medical that 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 patient in my point of care. That is my goal. My goal as a medical assistant, as a future nurse, is to make sure that that person that comes to my care, that their patient patient safety is number one important. And then if that patient say if that person is going through the same thing next door or next to me, that other person's safety is also in my care as well. And if something's going, going wrong, yes, I'm going to get a, a team of doctors to help me out. Yes, I'm going to get a team of doctors, but I'm not going to be taking pictures of the patient either. Like I, like I said yesterday. And abusing my privilege. I'm not trying to abuse my privilege at all. I'm not trying to abuse my privilege at all. No way. I don't want to abuse that privilege. I don't want to abuse it. I do not want to abuse my privilege being in the medical profession. And now they're talking about it. They, they were publishing about it in April saying... Doctors and hospitals in all over California and Santa Fe and San Francisco and Los, Los Angeles in April of 2020 say we have never seen so many empty beds in California. Why are there so many empty beds in California? People should be going through the door. Why are there so many empty beds in, in hospitals in California, but they're not the same in New York? And then one, one, one article said, we send people home from the hospital as soon as so we can free up beds for those who are waiting. But the pandemic has caused an unimaginable shift in demand for hospital services. Then like they're saying, oh, some people are propagating that there's a decline in heart attacks. There's a decline in strokes. And there's a decline in, in, in other emergencies just because people are not coming to the hospital anymore. Oh, there's a decline in heart attacks. There is no decline in heart attacks at all. People are still dying of heart attacks, but they're dying at their homes with no kind of care at all. They are afraid to go through to the hospital doors, to the hospital rooms, to the emergency rooms. And in one article, excuse me for not getting the source, it was a it was a, a, a California article. It says people would rather stay at home and suffer rather than risk coming to the hospital and getting infected with the coronavirus. They would rather stay at home and suffer in their illness and in their disease rather than go to the hospital and get care, get emergency care. Let me suffer and let me die in my sleep. Because I don't want to get any more sick than I already am. I'd rather just stay at home and die. And what they're doing is they're coming into hospitals, to the emergency rooms, at the very last point of care. So that way, doctors, when they come and see these patients, they can't do anything else but to let them, to, 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 to see them, watch them die in their, in their last stages. 
They're at the very, very final stage. And these people's already life threatening anyway. So doctors, they can't even do anything, anything about it, but try to keep them stable as much as possible. People, please do not be afraid of going to the hospital. Do not be afraid of going to the hospital. That was another, that was another a source I got from a, a, an article, an article in April 2020, in a newspaper article. People can stop. It, it, deaths can be prevented. Yes, yes, the coronavirus rate is still high. Yes, it's still still high. The rate of trans transmission for the coronavirus is still high. But there are other emergencies out there that are still as equally important. So when the Spanish flu hit, there wasn't a lot of a lot of uh, uh, care for hospitals. They had basic nursing care, basic nursing care. So when the Spanish flu hit, it decimated everything. Even nurses were dying because of it. But now it's not 1918 anymore. Now we're in a new millennium with new technology and new communication all around the world. So if something happens in one part of the world, even in Asia or even in South America or even in, even in the hicks of Africa, even the low-end native parts of Africa, it could be communicated across the world in less than 30 minutes just because of the Internet. And you can stop spread of transmission of diseases. Now you think if technology was that much more advanced with the internet and with and with and with millennial communication, why would so many people be dying at such a rapid pace? If technology was that advanced and communication was that fast, you could call somebody in Africa and five minutes later and you be in Sweden, they're be in Nigeria, or you be in, in New York and they be in, in Hong Kong, you can get from New York to Hong Kong in less than 10 hours. If technology and communication and transportation was that much more advanced, why would a flu virus come in and decimate our whole population like that? Why would an old, old flu bug come in, advance, take over economies and close down governments just like that? If we were so technology and driven and technology advanced, why would something so simple as a pneumonia flu bug come in and kill hundreds of thousands of people in less than a year? What is going on? How can this be measured? How can this be assessed? And how can we stop this? Stop from being dumb. From being dumb to this happening again. Because if it happened before, it's going to happen again. And it's going to happen again. And it's going to kill more people. And the flu bug is going to get more and more and more advanced. Because if the flu bug was at advanced in 1918 and it still is advanced in 2020, believe you me, the next go around couple of years, it's going to even kill more and more and more people. So we need to do something about it. Because the flu bug still has not changed. It still has not changed at all, at all, at all. What have we not learned since 1918? What have we not learned and through a new a new a new millennia? What have we not learned? What have we not learned? All of this could have been prevented. If YouTube and Google and the internet and millions of languages all across the world are available, communication is available for people all across the world. If communication is so great, why are we still dying of old age trans transcommutable diseases that are still lying doormat in our grounds in our or in our earth 
why are old doormat diseases still killing us as a society? Old dormant diseases. Old dormant. Dormant. D-O-R-M-A-N-T. Why are these all these old doormat diseases killing us as a society if we are so much advanced in 5G and 6G technology? We have telephones, we have cell phones, we have computers. We have wires in the ground, wires built in the ground to go to Africa, to from Africa to the United States. Facebook is building underground wires to Africa. Amazon CEO has now become the world's first trillionaire. The U.S. government is giving away $3 trillion. How are we so much money-driven and money-hungry society? And at the same time, old diseases from the early 1900s are killing us still as of today. Old 1900s diseases are still killing us. Why is it that? <laughs> so I, we still got a lot to learn and I still got a lot to learn. I'll try to get my presentation ready for you guys. I'll try to fix it up because I was a hot mess. It is an issue. And a lot of this preventive care can be taken care of. It can be taken care of. But preventive care, telehealth, like I said before, like I said before, telehealth is not an excuse for you not to walk through those hospital doors, emergency room doors, and get treatment for a heart attack. If you are having signs of a stroke and if you are ha having signs of a heart attack, you need to take you and your family member need to drive you directly to the emergency room and get, get, get care for that stroke or that heart attack. Because calling the doctor and waiting for a phone call at midnight hour is not going to save your life. Telehealth, telehealth is not an excuse to still have a regular, a regular, regular physical contact with a doctor or a medical professional or a nurse. If that doctor and if that nurse has has the has the opportunity to call you on your phone, then they have the same opportunity to visit you in your home. To come and have sent somebody to knock on your door and make sure and check on you physically. If that doctor, if that nurse has the same authority to call you on their on, on their on, on your phone, then they have the same authority to send somebody to your house and to check on you. Oh yes, they do. Oh yes, they do. All they have to do is just write an order for home health. All it's just simple, just write an order. And you can have somebody into your, at, knocking on your door at your home in less than 24 hours. Check it on you, check it on you physically. And bring it back the results to the doctor. So if the doctor says, oh, I can only make phone calls, that's all I can do. I can't, I can't send somebody down to check on you. You need to get another doctor. I'm going to say it one more time and I'm going to say it again. Telehealth is not an excuse for you not to physically be seen by a medical professional. That is still not an excuse for you to be seen by a medical professional. If they have the same opportunity to make a phone call to check on you, they have the same opportunity to write order and to send somebody to come to your home and to knock on your door and make sure that you are okay. And all that doctor has to do is just to write an order, send the script to the agency, and that agency to send somebody to your home and check on you at least three to four, three to five times a week. And they can bill it to your, your insurance. It's that, it's that easy. And you don't have to do anything but just wait for them to, to give you a call. 
It's easy. Home health is easy. It's been like this for years and years and years, and it is nothing new. Telehealth is not new. It is old. It is old. And people think, oh, we got this new thing. It's called telehealth. They are lying to you. It is old, 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 old as a crack doodle doo It is called good old, good old home health phone calls. A doctor is going to make a house call to you. It is old, 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 and it is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. It is old, 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 old. If you're paying for a doctor, if you're paying for a doctor's services, you have to complain to that doctor and make sure that, that somebody comes and physically sees you. Even during a pandemic. Even through an, an epidemic, make sure that somebody can come to your house and physically check on you and make sure and notices your signs and symptoms because it has not changed. There were nurses going to people's doors and doors and houses and houses and checking on them in the 1900s. And now in the millennial, we can't do the same thing. No, no, that's not right. That is not right. That's not right. There has to be a change to that as well. One more time. One more time for Laqueen, Laqueen Battle speech for today. Telehealth is not an excuse for you to be seen physically by a medical professional. It is not an excuse. It is not an excuse for somebody to come in and get your vital shines and make sure that you are physically assessed and physically okay. Physically assessed. Physically assessed. Physically, your whole human anatomy and your body. Am I physically okay? Do I look okay or do I sound okay? Do I sound okay? I, yeah, I may sound okay. And I may be lying to you, doctor, through your, through your teeth. So I need somebody to come in and check on me. I need a department, a corps of nurses to come in my community and check on my community for me. But the government's not instituted that. The only one I saw was Mayor Bill Bellazio. He's calling them uh, contract tracers, which is a good thing, and it can be a bad thing at the same time. So that's that's my little popo for today. All right, so thank you so much, guys. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, and I am on Zoom. The Zoom has been recorded. It's been so many uh, scribbles. I did have a presentation. Again, this is only the first part of of my um my feed i just went off this barehandedly i had a presentation i'm going to try to make sure that the presentation is available and, and ready and set to go <laughs> i'm going to screen this back to you guys as well as all the groups i'm connected to thank you for the opportunity to become to listen to you guys tonight in your homes it is now nine o'clock on sunday may the 17th 2020 i'm very happy to be here i'm very happy to see that i have gotten a lot of responses some negative which is okay i do take negative feedback and i can use it for my own good as well as to a lot of other people that are out there and available and god is good every single day sometimes you got to do things by yourself in order to Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. That's what it's called. It's called life. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And you know what? This is only getting bigger and better. It's only getting bigger and better. It's only getting bigger and better. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm going to say it one more time. One more time. I'm only a medical assistant, but I'm only going off of my personal observations as well as my thoughts and feelings and emotions. One more time. One more time. Telehealth is not an excuse for you to, to, be, to not be seen by a, to not be physically seen by a medical professional. So for somebody to call you on the phone and say, all I can do is just make a simple phone call, that is not an excuse for you not to get medical care. Telehealth is not a substitute for medical care. It is not a substitute for medical care.
You still need to be physically seen and physically assessed by a doctor in order to, to figure out what is really going on my thyroid, to figure out what is really going on. Telehealth is not an, a substitute for primary preventive medicine. It is not a substitute for, for, for primary care. And if you are using telehealth as an excuse for people not to go to the emergency, to emergency rooms, emergency departments, and get health, that is dumb and stupid. Telehealth is not a substitute for primary care. If you are going through a heart attack, heart attack, if you are going through a stroke, you need to have to call up somebody, get, get some help, get your neighbor, your daughter, your husband, your son, and drive yourself to the emergency room. You cannot do things like this on your own. It's not a, a phone call is not going to stop a stroke. A phone call is not going to stop a heart attack. A phone call is not going to stop diabetes. You have to get help at the emergency room. You've got to get help. You've got to get help. That's the only way it's going to work. You have to be physically screened and physically assessed. You cannot hide a heart attack. You cannot hide a stroke. And you cannot hide diabetes. And coronavirus is not an excuse for you not to continue to check your sugar and your glucose rates. So for, for people to say, oh, I got that, oh, I got COVID-19, oh, I got coronavirus, I don't have to check my sugar, that is not an excuse. Don't fall for that. And another thing, COVID-19 is not your get-out-of-jail-free get card either. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card for people that have been convicted of crimes. It is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. What you do is you get them and you transfer them to another facility. And you make sure that they serve the time. It is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It is not. And I am a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. COVID-19 is not an excuse for you to get out of jail for free. It is not an excuse. You did the crime and you served the time. It is not an excuse. All right, so this is a queen, the queen battle coming live from downtown Boston, Massachusetts. I love you guys. I'm so thankful that we were able to have this talk. Twitter. Facebook, and Zoom on Eventbrite. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to continue this conversation next Sunday, and hopefully I will have all my technology problems taken care of. I can share screens. I can share my screen on Facebook as well as Zoom and Eventbrite, and I can also feed it onto YouTube. Thank you, guys. I love you. Again, to my Twitter family, my three followers on Twitter, my 80 followers on YouTube, my uh, uh, 15, uh, 1,500 friends on Facebook, and now on Zoom. I thank you again to all the first responders, the policemen, the firemen, the EMS personnel, the doctors, the nurses, the clinical staff, the CNAs, the medical assistants, the PCTs, the mayors, the departments, governors, presidents, whoever you are. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. And congratulations to the class of 2020 Obama babies, 9-11 babies who are now 18 years old. All those babies that were born around, this, uh, around the September 11, 2001 attacks are now 18 years old. 18 years old. All those 9-11 babies are now 18 years old. So congratulations to the class of 2020. God is good. Thank you guys for the opportunity to be here today. Live from Boston, Massachusetts. This is LaQueen coming from downtown Boston. I love you guys. I will connect with you as well. Thank you for Twitter for hanging in with me, for Eventbrite, and for Facebook. All right. Love you guys. Bye.